held up and backed up by other library systems. So at this time, if you feel that this is the right way to go, I'm 100% behind you. I want one type, a virtual student card, one way or the other. I'll take what I can get, and this makes me happy. Right, we have a motion. I made a motion. There you have a motion. I just have a question. Um, can we get a motion and second before we get the discussion? Okay, motion has been moved and second that we accept the virtual student card presented information presented by Mr. Tuttle at the earlier meeting and today. Discussion. Okay, I just want to be clear because I love the virtual student mm -hmm. card. So the student will be able to check out physical books and have access to overdrive and who you want. They'll have access to all of our online materials. Okay. And there will be no restrictions there other than the standard ones that go with that. Okay. And then they will be allowed to uh, take out two uh, physical items at a given time. Okay. With the only limitation there being age appropriate materials, which we already do. There's nothing different there. And that we decided to take out DVDs. So, as far as the audio materials, it would be audio books. Okay. You know, so, at that time, so it's audio books and physical books, age appropriate. They would be so they would be um, juvenile and the teen level books for them. Correct. But they wouldn't be able to check out adult materials. Uh, teens are allowed to check out some adult okay. materials as far as the nonfiction books go. Okay. I just but, wanted to clarify with the motion. Mm -hmm. okay. But but upon the board's, I wouldn't say insistence. Uh, perhaps it was suggestion. Uh, we took DVDs out of there. Yeah, okay. Madam President. I just like to say, did we, I know we had a big discussion on the grades, so what did we decide on the grades? We're going to, we're going to go with K-12. Okay, gotcha. I, think I, uh, I, I sincerely doubt we'll see a whole lot of usage K-4, K-3, I don't know. The, <laughs> the, the third graders that I read to every Thursday over at Summer Grove Elementary School, I don't know. They seem to be very interested yeah. in the library when I talk to them about it. Yeah. We, can, we, can, we can be hopeful. Okay. Favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yes. Madam Chair. If I may, thank you, Mr. Sobel, for your careful analysis of all of this. I think this is going to be a great program for our community. Thank you. Moving on to item six, new business, employee evaluation report. You should have gotten a memo outlining what we're proposing. Deontay's giving you two different handouts. Um, one is a handout from one of the speakers that John and I listened to at HR Southwest, and the other is an article from, where is it, John? New York Times. I believe. New York Times article. Um, both talking about performance evaluations and proposals. Um, in what we're proposing in our research with what we heard at the conference and looking at what other libraries are doing, we are proposing developing competencies for each position in the library, then developing curriculum which would address those competencies. After that, we would um, develop an evaluation process and employees would set goals with their supervisors on levels of competencies to achieve each year. And then there would be a measurement of the, the attainment of that goal throughout the year. There would probably be a certain number of curriculum that would be required for each employee. And that total number of points at the end of the year would result in either a pass or a fail. And the individuals who passed would be eligible for a merit increase for one to be given. We have found a couple of other libraries in the country that are actually doing things similar to this and have welcomed us to borrow and, and reuse as much as as what they've already done. So it shouldn't be that we'd have to start from scratch. We definitely have a good place to, to take and then mold it to what our jobs are. Okay. I just wanted to ask Jenny, in read, reading the memo, Jenny, it also mentioned that the, uh, the curriculum that would be defined and developed and all uh, would be done after uh, or assisting in uh, developing job descriptions. So how long do you think it's going to take to actually implement this program when you have to do the evaluation process, you have to get the job descriptions, develop the curriculum or professional development programs that can assist them a year? 
six so, months? What do you think? I, I would think at a minimum a year, and this might be a couple of year project. Okay. The leadership team um, over the past couple of years have worked on updating classification descriptions, and we, we've gotten through <coughs> a lot of those. We would have to go back and revisit them addressing competencies. So that part of it I don't think would be quite as intensive as really applying competencies to every job and then how, how to measure when you've achieved a competency, there's going to be different, some different things like that. So a minimum of a year, potentially, you know, a little bit more than that. Are the, are the employees aware that uh, such a process is being developed that will be tied into potential merit raises? We were waiting to see if this was the direction that the board wanted us to take and if this is the direction y'all like to go. I have been talking about it with my HR staff just because it's impacting some of the things they do. Thank you. Could you expand a little bit on what you mean by core competencies and what was involved in finding them in the curriculum? Well, we attended one class that was nothing but what you would call core competencies. Let's say for administration, it would be leadership, which has about five or six different ones under there, where you can understand being able to uh, mentor people, being able to have the right interpersonal skills, uh, showing various other skills that are needed for the leadership quality. Uh, for customer service, you would have at least three or four under there, one being an awareness of how to take care of the customer. Uh, Again, interpersonal skills, and uh, I have to say that the gentleman's class was very straightforward. He gave us like six or seven standard core competencies and defined each one of them. And then the other two library systems we have found expanded upon that. So you're you're talking your basic work duties where your interpersonal skills are, are what are required to be able to work day to day, customer service, both internal and external. Um, the ability to understand your job and job duties and you know, put forth the effort uh, to do the job and continue uh, learning how to do your job and continue growth and like that. I really wish I brought that sheet of paper in that had my cheat sheet notes on all that in there, but I failed to do that. Uh, if you'd like, I can write and get it. Well, I guess not. Uh, so basically this is your job description. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what was interesting about the way this gentleman did it is the way he put them all together and interrelated them so that you understand that you need to be competent in these five areas to have good customer service skills and you need to be competent in these five areas to have good leadership skills. So, it wasn't just saying, you know, interpersonal skills. It defined it by these very different cores. The competencies made up that, that core for that one. And we, we see uh, the failing grade is all the way to the very first. The failing grade, it, it, we haven't quite worked out how we want to go with that, but we. You have to have at least some line in there. Failure to go through and, and improve if you get a needs improvement on any, in any of your core competencies. Failure to follow up. And most of the time, if you get a needs improvement on anything, you'd be given the opportunity to go to the training to make up for that, see definite improvement. Uh, what we're trying to move away from is one of these scales where it's uh, prefer to go to military style pass or fail. And as long as you scored so many points and you did so many classes and this, that, and the other. Again, we're not 100% sure. We're looking at three or four different models at this point. And as we decide which one would be easier for us to implement in the, in the time frame, we'd be more than happy to bring it forward and let you guys look at it. I have to put, sorry, to this. Number one, if it's the only race that employers would get to move forward, like if we just gave away, I mean, like five to the two percent. We, we were actually thinking about splitting all raises from here on out. It would be uh, you'd have a cost of living offset, which would be automatic for all employees, and then a merit 
or anybody doing that. That is, at this time, what we're thinking about. That would have to be two raises. And Mary, raises is that who evaluate them? Now, supervisor? Correct. Okay. Another thing. Everybody in that one department, I'm sure, will not be able, I mean, suppose, well, let's just put it like this way. In that one department, you got 15 people. That means somebody going to be slighted. No matter, no, let me finish saying, maybe about okay. a second, ten, please. And I'm looking, any employer sales that you have had to wear to be placed on improvement plan, which would include mandatory class and problems, a sale employee would not be able to receive any merit increase for that year. I am not a merit paid person. I so one person I may achieve, and you may, may achieve, I guess, let me use it, a failing school. You know already the top students already going to magnet. I mean, use us. I taught in one. <coughs> I worked my butt off as hard as that person at magnet. My kids went up. But for as I went to serve, we were failing school. And those teachers work as hard as the ones at magnet and everybody else. So I'm thinking that if you're going to do this in an apartment, people work hard. It might not be what you think, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Well, it, and my understanding that we're, we're, we're talking about the proficiency versus the growth in education, and, and so as far as, I, I don't think we're going to draw a line of proficiency too much, and we're going to keep that low enough that anybody who gives their best should be able to do that, but we're going to be measuring on a regular basis as long as there's growth, and that's why we want to tie it more to the continuing education. And as long as they're making a good faith effort and they're taking their classes the way they should be, it should not be that difficult. I just don't like, I feel that we're going to give a raise, everybody gets a raise. Let the merit thing be a, a bonus or whatever you want. That's just me. I'm talking about something. That's me. I don't know. They can explain something more. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. There were several things in the in there that I in the um, first of all hats off uh, to you all who did the work on this to our staff who did the work on this to come up with something to present us because it's always a challenge to try to uh, start with something and work from the ground up. Um, in terms of merit pay, I am um, not the biggest proponent of it, uh, even though I do believe that our efforts, uh, meritorious efforts, uh, we need to be rewarded for it. Um, but oftentimes, it is so subjective that it's not done in an equitable manner. And that would be one of my concerns. And <clears throat> rather than merit pay, whereas you get a increase that will continue the year after the year after, I would, you know, if I were going to consider anything, I would be more leaning toward a bonus. Whereas, as our director said, if you had X number of points, say, if you have, if you're on a point scale out of 100 points, if you have 95, that might be, that might. Uh, warrant, <coughs> if you have more than 100, if you have 100 plus, then maybe that might warrant a bonus. But everything else up to that, that's just um, your core competencies that you're expected, everybody's expected to do that anyway. So uh, I remember at, at a school that I used to work at, the principal uh, every year gave extra miler incentives or, or, or rewards. And it was for those people who went beyond the call of duty. And it was documentable. You could see it. Everybody knew it. But uh, they went beyond these four competencies to achieve more. Because you didn't pay for, you didn't pay to meet the, the competencies. You, you, you're being paid to be a competent employee. So, you know, I think that maybe if we looked at anything, it would be to look at some type of bonus that we only get that, that's um, in 
employees only get that year, and um, and it's worth going beyond the uh, job description, beyond the core competencies, and you know, and, and that could be an ongoing discussion with the um, with the supervisor in terms of you know how am I doing you know along the way you know and you're documenting so that at the end you know it won't say well you know I thought I was going to get this and I should have and I've been doing but you all have been communicating along the way um, in some um, structured way so that nobody there's no surprises. Well, to the documents that both the documents that we gave to you. Uh, in most, I would say most Fortune 500. There is a trend in Fortune 500 companies going away from the whole year-end evaluation, and, and we're actually on the cutting edge by doing monthly work plans at this point. Uh, what we're trying to look at is how to make that a little bit more tied into our continuing education and define it a little bit better as far as what uh, goals we might want to look at as far as. You know, if you're customer service oriented, you want these these type of goals. If you're if you're say cataloging, you want those type of goals. Different types of that, that are easily reachable. Uh, we're not we're not trying to punish anybody, but we, we are trying to set a level to make sure that everybody is maintaining, as you say, the standard. And, and I did see the, the work plans. I, you know, I saw that you wanted that you were considering. Um, Using the works, the monthly work plans, as opposed to using an annual evaluation, which I think the monthly work plans do lead toward uh, an annual evaluation. So they I can see how they do both uh, go hand in hand. And then the one thing that I really was opposed to was the failing grade. I don't think we should use any terminology such as a failing grade, especially when we actually begin to implement anything like this. And uh, in terms of uh, getting remediation, getting called remediation, you called it uh, based on an improvement plan. Well, that's not what mentors pay. That's not what that's about, improvement plans and all that. It's about somebody who is you know, just so driven that they go beyond the call of duty and they get a bonus. That's you know, how I'm looking at it. And we're not trying to help them along the way and push them, you know, and guide them through this, this effort. This is something that they're doing independently and, and you know, and it just happens. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. if I can speak, I agree with both board members that uh, there is some danger in merit pay, but I would like to see us move towards a more objective way of evaluation rather than just an, a subjective evaluation. And uh, I, I, I see what you're saying about failing grade, but what we're really referring to is a, an employee failing to achieve a passing grade. So that's just terminology we can get that worked out. I would like to see us continuing to look into this and possibly look at some core competency examples and um, go step by step through the process. I think there's a lot of value in um, rewarding someone for a job well done. Mm -hmm. And if everybody gets the same raise no matter what, you're always going to have people that are not going to live up to the standard, unfortunately. And so then we have the person that does twice as much, like you said. And this would give us a way to reward that person that goes extra mile. And they would, everyone would still, I think John, you said everyone would still get a cost of living raise. So that would take care that would, that would offset health insurance increases, pension increases, things of that nature. I would like to see us go further with this. I, I mean, it, it's maybe too soon to say yes, we all agree we want to do it, but I think it has a lot of value. Well, I'll attempt to speak after. I'll, I'll speak to Tom a little bit. Yes. Okay. Yeah, 
they might be. Lawlessness. Uh, I think that they were probably prohibited from different lawlessness. I say well, the very increases in the state of laws to give laws. And I understand as a teacher, a former teacher, how you feel about that. When people do jobs where they're easily, most of easily measure things that they do, uh, America, I think you're appropriate. You can do intangibles, it's less appropriate. If someone has to stack a thousand books a day and they stack 900, you know, they have to understand it. Where would it be? Most people have some jobs and quantifiable, objective things that the job is to measure. Uh, I just want to notice that the opponent of Mary Clay, I like it. I think it's a good idea. I also think it's not a good idea to pay people, to give people very inquiries if they are unsatisfactory or whatever term you want to use for about being the standard. It's an increased incentive for most people to make the standard. Just one final comment. I was, I was going to mention the same thing Neil did, that uh, local governments and state government cannot give bonuses. But the way I see it, I'm, I'm also for merit pay. I think people need to meet certain minimum standards in order to be eligible for the pay. But here's the thing I, I think that concerns everybody when you're talking about merit pay, is, or when you're talking about bonuses. Because if you're evaluating somebody and you're fearful that not, it's not going to be objective, that it could be very subjective, then you say that could be detrimental to the person that's anticipating and hoping to get a merit raise. By the same token, the same thing can happen if you did attempt to give bonuses. If you like somebody, it could be subjective. You could give it to, to, to your friends. So I think the whole issue is, as, as Connie said, or as Julia said, in my opinion, is to take it step by step and let it, let it evolve and Jenny, if you wouldn't mind, let us know at what stage you are. The most critical stage, after you've identified the core competencies and you've written your job description and so forth, is going to be to develop that instrument that is, is solely performance-based, so that either someone did or didn't do what was required or what was agreed to. And if that's the case, you take out the subjectivity. But you have to be careful when you're writing those medical standards that in fact they are totally objective. You either did or you didn't. Where anybody looking at it would be able to say, you did or you didn't. And it's not up to the supervisor. It's not how they feel about what you did or the quality of what you did or the amount that you did, but you either did or you didn't do that competency. So I'm for the merit raise concept. And take it slowly, you usually said, it might take up to two years. Let's see how it goes so it's totally fair for the employees. Let's see if we can sum this up. <coughs> when we first started talking about this on the board, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we were working with our director's evaluation form when this first <coughs> came up. Is that true? My recollection is that the September board meeting, when we were discussing the raise for the employees, there were a couple of board members that specifically said they would like to see us tie raises to performance. Mm -hmm. And then several of you voiced concerns about the subjectivity that can go along with that process. So okay. taking these two different views and trying to remove as much subjectivity as possible and come up with something that's measurable with what you've got in front of you now. Okay. So, my question is, was there any problem with the measurement, form of measurement, and evaluating employees that has been previously used? You mentioned here the monthly work plan. <laughs> Have there been any objections or any problems that came out of the use of the monthly work plan? Okay, let me see. In, Was in, that not objective? Well, but the monthly work plan really doesn't have set measurables. It, 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 and again, uh, 
it's a nice form, and what it's clearly designed to create a conversation between the supervisor and the employee. There are three different points there, but as far as having any measurable way of, of doing anything on that work plan, not so much. Uh, but it, but what, what it does for us is that it forces the supervisor and the employee to have that monthly sit down face to face that in a lot of organizations you never have that opportunity. There are, I can remember in Houston Public, I was lucky if I ever got to see my supervisor. If I saw my supervisor once a month when I was a branch manager, I was doing good. Um, this, in most of our branches, you get day to day interaction, but some of the folks like our night and weekend managers may not get to see the branch manager that often. So this forces that, that interaction and, and a lot of communication. The problem with this form at this time, and even our current assessment form, is there's really no measurables. It is totally subjective at this point, unless you've got documentation to prove anything beyond needs. Any needs improvement needs documentation, but anything else to that is just... So the major need is to make a measure. Measure. Not to and tie merit pay to. We, 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 you can make that argument too. Yes, you can. Now, when I first started reading um, this that you presented, uh, Mr. Tubman, in the past, after the first two paragraphs, I said, oh, they're going to present something to us that has nothing to do with merit pay. That's what I thought until I saw read on the last part because we're still talking about it. But I kind of um, denoted that you're not really in favor of their pay. I wouldn't necessarily say that. Okay. What I would say is, and I think this has already been stated by several people, it needs to be done properly. We need to take our time. If we are going to go in this direction, we need to get those competencies developed and it is going to be key developing that scoring mechanism. That's probably the biggest challenge. Um, mm -hmm. I, will also say, I will also say, I between Deontay and I, we see the evaluations that are currently done. And in recent years, we've required supervisors who have indicated an employee needs improvement or exceeds, they have to provide documentation why they are rating that employee below or above. Um, but even then, there are certain supervisors that tend to rate all of their employees very highly year after year after year. There are other supervisors that look like they take it a little bit more um, straightforward and, and truly try to note where people need improvement. But overall, most supervisors have difficulty telling their employees, you need to improve in these areas. That's what I see in the evaluations that come across our air. Okay, is there any room there for peer evaluation? Actually, in, in making it objective. a couple of our directors' uh, roundtable luncheons, we have had staff ask for <coughs> such things, so it's not off the table. We, we kind of been very interested in, in the 360 degree evaluation process. I've got had my staff evaluate me uh, beyond what you guys did, so I had a little fun with that. It was what, what was it? Continue, stop, and start, right? to tell me things to continue, things to start, things to stop. So it was, it, it, there's another, it, I, the same lady who we gave you the, uh, the major packet from uh, HR Southwest, she has some wonderful uh, coaching and mentoring tools, and that, that is one of them we've seen. So there, there is so much out there. There, I know. It, I did a little research yeah. on that conference. I saw 415 articles, full text. Uh huh. Articles on. So. It, it, it's going. It, it's not going to be easy wading through it all, nor will it be easy uh, to come up with the, the, the tool. 
What we have going in our favor is we have several other library systems that are already a decade ahead of us, with, and they are willing to share uh, what they have. And, uh, so that, that's, that's in our favor. So we're, we're, not, we're not pioneers in this by any means. So the conclusion is that we're going to continue to research and get help from others and come back at a later date? That's what we're proposing. To oh, yes. Oh, yes. First thing we want to do is come up with our core competencies, which is what we're working on, and we'll bring those to you. Okay. Now, that's, that's another thing I wanted to ask about, the core competencies. You're going to have core competencies for each position. Hmm. It has to be for each position, because I... Well, you'll have four or five that will be. Yeah, I that. You'll have four or five that will be organizational. That, that no matter where you work, you, you, you need to have certain interpersonal skills. You need to have certain customer service skills. You need to have certain things. No matter what, what it, it doesn't matter if you're the, 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 uh, the doc guy out here, if you're Susan back there, or if you're the frontline staff in, in Orange Point, it, it doesn't matter who you are. They're, they're, you're going to have five or six key competencies that you need to have as an employee. Then there will be some say, let's just say Susan and Jim in the finance area will need to have different competencies than say our reference staff. They're going to need certain types of com uh, competencies that will be different from what I need as opposed to what uh, the rest of our support services may need. So there, there will be four or five. I'm pretty sure five is the number we've been looking at that will be across the organization for everybody. And then each other uh, job description, depending on where it is, will have its own competencies associated with it that are specific to that job or that band of jobs. This is not going to be easy, trust me. It's going to be like <coughs> crazy. But we'll, 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 we'll work through it and, and keep you guys informed every step of the way. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll go try next next one. Proposed revision of the board. Bye-bye. I'm going to let you have that business too, Manoa. This is her baby. Okay. Uh, I quickly went, can you hear me? Yes. I quickly went through the before I left for my uh, time on. And since then, we found a couple little things that we want to change also. But if you have your uh, proposed bylaw changes before you, if you'll look on page 16, does everyone have that? Okay. On page 16, uh, Section 8, number 2, in red, you see where we added, it says appoints, the president appoints members to all committees as needed except for the nomination committee. We found that this was in Robert's Rules of Order like this, uh, that the president does not uh, nominate the members of the nomination committee, nor does she serve as ex officio. Um, on number eight, under section eight, we first thought, is this necessary or does it combine, uh, or should we combine it with number two? But then decided that the formal education assistance review committee, there's only one person, it's not really a committee, it's composed of staff too. Any questions? The, the reason for the nominating committee, the, the president only to do the chair is to keep it looking like there might be some favoritism with that, the way Robert's rules suggest doing it at this point. Okay. When I was a board president, I was uncomfortable doing that. Right. Okay, on page 17, since I mailed this out to you, we found a place that we need to change is uh, under C3, near the top of the page where it says uh, the associate directors, chief financial officer, and the project manager should have the same authority. We no longer have a project manager, and we were going to replace that with the access services 
coordinator. Area manager. Oh, area manager. <laughs> access services area manager. Or area managers for access services. Lynn Slater. Lynn Slater, yes. Didn't we have a project manager um, on staff? We did. He retired. Okay. That was David's position. It's currently frozen, and we are reevaluating just what we need to do with it at this time. Uh, it's been frozen for about eight months at this time, and uh, we haven't stopped reporting. So Can we're looking at perhaps other things. Area, area manager of the access services department. We did an entire state. Number three, yeah. signs, requisitions. This is talking about the secretary. <coughs> signs, requisitions, and presents bills for payment, observing standard and sound accounting procedures as mutually agreed. In parentheses, the associate directors, chief financial officer, and the project manager, which we are striking out and replacing with access services uh, area manager shall have the same authority as the executive director to sign requisitions and present bills for payment. Question. What number six? Number six, we're just we're removing the project, the project manager. Madam Chair, yes. if I may, what did the project manager do? Like what was that? person's role? That's a very interesting question, Shannon. Uh, he, for the most part, the last few years of his time here, he oversaw this building and the, the building as far as interacting with the architects and construction crews and overseeing all of that. Uh, he also did some fleet management for us and on occasion he would sign uh, various bills and, and help with the financial services as far as paying those things. A lot of those duties now have been farmed out. Uh, we no longer have any uh, uh, this building going on, and so our facilities management has been taking care of uh, looking over the buildings. Uh, they've also taken over fleet management duties, and a lot of the other financial services duties have been divided up among the access services area manager, both of the associate directors and myself. A lot of it is signing off on POs and approving POs and other invoices as they are generated. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now on the same page, go down to E, the last paragraph on 17, page 17. Mm -hmm. We're going to change where that third sentence says staff person and the instructional coordinator. Well, we have changed the title of instructional coordinator to training and development coordinator. So we just want to make a simple change of title there. Is that 17? Page 17. I don't have it marked on the other copy. This is one of those we discovered after I mailed it. The third sentence under E. Uh, staff person and the instead of instructional, just put uh, training and development. Third line, I think, third sentence. Third line. In parentheses. Okay. Now turn over to page 19. You know, some of these things we learned at the uh, trustee workshop that myself and uh, Tom Teddy attended. So we're putting those Ms. Hayes will be attending soon. Right, she attends tomorrow. And yes, I will be attending tomorrow. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so between that or and Andy will kill me. <laughs> between that and Robert's Rules of Order, we decided we need to change, we had to change the quorum because we were told that it includes ex officios if they have voting rights and they do. Ours do. So therefore, we have to have more people for a quorum when they're not attending. Uh, so we uh, added in red that a simple majority of the appointed trustees 
and includes the ex officios. A quorum shall consist of simple majority and includes the ex officios. Now, I'm not sure if ex officios is spelled right. No, no it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just say ex officio members? That wouldn't hurt you. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that correction. And then it says vacant positions count in determining a quorum. I had forgotten about that, you know, with today. I thought maybe five would be end up here. But six are still, is still the quorum because we have to count our vacancy. Okay, and then I removed part, uh, that last sentence. In the event there are vacancies among the appointed positions, then a quorum shall consist of the majority of the remaining appointed trustees. That's not right. It's not true. So I have a question. Vacancies means that there's a position available, but there's nobody to fill the position, right. not that somebody's not here, right? right. Okay. Okay. So uh, on that part, the last part of that sentence, that is not right. Uh, now, where in the um, really documentation? Where is the documentation for that? Are you talking about the one through four? Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. That when when I read this and I talked to talk, talk to you, asked you about it, how did we get to the point of needing to promote propose the uh, to make the amendments and we speculated that maybe it had something to do with um, Kathy's and Tom's going to the session that they attended, maybe they got it out of that. Or well, the Robert's Rules of Order, which we didn't look at it to see. But uh, it would have been really helpful if we would have had to speculate had it been in, you know, part of this. And we can see that it, what we're doing is conflict with the Robert's Rules of Order. But thank you for asking her to share that with Would it be a bad taste if I started the Jeopardy theme song right now?
I think the most important part of the call is what Meg emphasizes that the ex officio must be counted. So you 
want to tell me where you found that song reference it? <laughs> you know, my page is 12 and 13, and your page is 12. I think I almost want to put you on. Yeah, mine's 12 and 13. It's really fast, I think. That's the We got what's going on. Mine's 159. And hers is 159 in the same book. Okay, um, Okay, what I heard you read, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the board itself decides the number uh, that makes the form. So, um, so, okay, they say to prevent a quorum, a minimum number of members who must be present. This requires a meeting and conduct business. Right. Uh, and you said that must be the majority. Mm -hmm. And um, you said, did I heard you say that yeah. just the member said it's our quorum. It's not like it's a members. Okay. Well, remember, that's in the bridge version. They said quorum the majority of the members. You can look at the Hunter Bridge version that says that it must be, the bylaws must specify what a quorum is. Right, and that's what I mean. We decide what the quorum is and, our bylaw, and whatever our bylaw says, that's not quorum. At the same time, you're supposed to be going following Robert's Rules of Order. If y'all have to that in. And, 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 and that is the Robert's Rules of Order that we're reading, right? That just says it. The new revised. But we also have the, the hard court. Yeah. But let, let, Is it? let Shannon find out tomorrow why this yeah, state. Yeah, I can, but I want to direct you to um, page 43 of the 11th edition. We're talking about this. Oh, the board members. 483. Just to paraphrase. Um, Without exception, ex officio members of boards and committees have exactly the same rights and privileges as do all other members. There are two instances in which ex officio members are not counted in determining the number required for a quorum or in determining whether or not a quorum is present. The instances are, if it's the president, whenever the bylaws provide that the president shall be an ex officio member of all committees, so whatever we say. Two, when the ex officio member of the board of committee is neither an ex officio officer of the board of committee nor a member, employee, or elected official, elected or appointed officer of the society. For example, when the governor of a state is made ex officio a member of a private college board. So those two instances, they would not be uh, counting the number to make a form. Does that make it any clearer or is it still like? And I, and I hadn't finished, but thank you for that. Is that and that is um, in the years that I've been on the board, uh, I as a fiscal have never, uh, right? never somebody might have jumped up once or twice, but mm -hmm. just on a regular basis, they don't come. And I think that we would, uh, that, you know, if we decide what our forum is, if our board decides that, then we would be unfair to ourselves and to the public if we included the ex officios <laughs> as the number that we base our uh, quorum on. You know, we were trying to do 60% or whatever the members that we included then in that count, we would be doing ourselves and our public concerns, I believe, because they don't have a company. Yeah, we don't have a choice. Right. We have to include them. According to our, our uh, state library consultant, she has told us that we have to. We need to see that in writing. We have kept, anybody can make a verbal mistake or get erroneous information. That needs to be in writing. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, Dolores. Uh, you know, it would be helpful to have someone with, uh, speak with authority regarding this, even though. It has been clearly uh, expressed to us, specifically because we asked the questions that she had to look it up in order to determine that the, the mayor of Shreveport, ex officio, has voting rights. And in some other parishes that were there, the people did not have voting rights. It depended on the structure. And she said, so your ex officios do have voting rights, so they must be counted in the quorum. Now we can we can find out about that. So what Kathy and I decided to do, and like Shannon to be a part of it, what we did is we highlighted 
all of the things that were particular interest to us in developing our bylaws and making sure we're following state policies and procedures, she is receptive to coming and elaborating and giving the specifics, which is what we're going to do. We're going to give her an outline of all of the topics we found were important that uh, either contradicted what we were doing or supported some of the things we thought were important. We'd like to find out from Shannon what she'd like to add to that. And she said she'd be happy to come and spend a half hour and elaborate and explain to anybody exactly what it was they needed to know as far as documentation. So okay. we can take that avenue. I just wish to ask uh, our board member. Now, I'm assuming that these are revisions that have been made in Robert's room. Uh, these are revisions in addition to the no need to right respect for the submitted from doing the minutes. Aren't these changes that have occurred in Rhonda's rooms? I believe so. I mean, this is not a personal authoritative statement. It's changes in the Rhonda's rooms. Is that what I'm asking? Yes, and she explained that I can't, I can't do it right now. I don't recall because it's been a few months exactly the structure of each of the library systems in the various parishes. And she said they, they had to abide by the way the structure, the organizations were structured to abide by certain rules, uh, governing rules. And in this case, the ex officios, because they did have voting rights, she looked it up, came back, said they do have voting rights. They must be, they must be, not can be or should be, they have to be uh, as voting members, uh, part of what constitutes a quorum. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is we, we can't just not include that in our bylaws. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Ms. Lee. What I'm saying is <clears throat> this is how I am, and this is how we should be able to Anybody can come and tell us anything. They can come and spend 30 minutes, an hour, nine minutes, and tell us anything. If they don't have something in writing that, that uh, I can see that is valid, and, it's, and we're going to change something based on what no, they say. No, sure, we want documentation. Yeah, say, we're going to make, based on, change, change, change what we're doing based on what they're saying, and they can't provide with, to us a valid documentation or uh, information that, that will uh, be resourceful in us going to find the information and reading it for ourselves, then I'm still not going to be born. Madam President, would, would, it, would it please the board if we just tabled this one until the yes, next meeting? Uh, and that we could have Meg come in and bring the documentation needed to justify all of these changes? That's good. Now, uh, are we still going to have your reports at a later date? Yes. Okay. I'll report. She, she will be uh, developing her presentation based on some of these specific items because the entire program she presents. Uh, it's about four or five hours, but she'll highlight the ones that we found uh, where we were not necessarily following what was mandated uh, by the state. And that was one of them, was that we were not counting uh, our ex officio members as part of the quorum. And she said, you have to. Now, she did at that meeting tell us, but we didn't write down every piece of documentation mm -hmm. because just, just her, our, our outline of the program with seven pages, so our documentation was very expensive, extensive of everything. So she'd be more than happy to elaborate. She said that at the meeting, let me know. I'll come spend a half hour with your board and explain and justify and look up while I'm there any documentation they need, which she did when she did the presentation. Somebody asked a question. And they were right there. Okay. Yes. Madam President, I'd like to move that we take the list topic until we get additional information. Second. Uh, we table this up. Uh, this issue until we get further information. So uh, Shannon is going, and we're going to try to get the presenter. We'll get back to come. To come. Okay. Question. Okay. I'd like also whatever whatever page is on, you can direct put that down when we say go to this page, but we can all try to find it. Yes, the reference. Okay. Okay. Understand. Okay. This, um, and I, uh, you're talking about the whole uh, proposed amendment. You're talking about the whole the one that she bylaws, the, the amendment, the whole thing that we're taking the whole thing. I, I wasn't under that impression. 
color you pick? Uh, bolding? Matte. Oh, you pick that to wall? No, no, no. about the main motion and the Robert Schultz Award that's found under Chapter 3, Section 6, Descriptions of Classes and Individual Motion. Um, a motion, as we know, is a formal proposal by a member in a meeting that the group take a certain action. For example, um, we've had some discussion about the virtual library card. So someone made a motion to um, accept the recommendation of the Director. That was a formal request, a formal proposal to act on something. So that is a motion. There are many different types of motions, but the one we'll talk about today is the main motion. A main motion is one whose introduction brings business before an assembly. Now here's the important part. Strictly speaking, there should be no debate on a matter before a motion regarding it has been made. So like you know, we'll bring up something, and I know I'm guilty of this, we'll start talking about it, and we really can't talk about it really legally until there's a motion and a second, and then there's up for discussion. So only one main motion may be before the assembly for action at any time. So you can't have three people making motions. It's one motion that is either seconded or dies for lack of a second. If it's seconded, then they discuss it. And Vote it up or down, then you have to, if possible, make, if necessary, make another motion. One motion at a time. Okay. <laughs> but this is a very handy guide, and if you want to have that fleshed out again, it's on page 62 of the 11th edition. It's chapter 3. Section 6, and it starts at line 18. Thank you. 
to our situation. Thank you so very much. You are quite welcome. Thank you for the honor of being with you. <laughs> any comments? Any of them? Now we're down. I direct you. Any comments? We're down to number B. Assignment of committee members. We're going to call these out. They have selected their first, second, third choice. In some cases, I might have to rearrange. <clears throat> but here they are. If you don't like the baby, they fix it. <laughs> On the executive committee, I'll serve there. Nominated committee. That's where they came. The nominated committee is 
to select the citizen president. That was another change that we talked about. And we don't want to vote today. You will come well. How does that go, Kathy? We come back with a slate and then we vote the next meeting. Yes, the, the nominating committee must meet again to come up with a recommendation for the vice president. And that, you know, committee, uh, you cannot be on the, as an ex officio of that one. And um, you can either go with your current selection from last year or make a new one. Except um, I don't think you can appoint the nominating committee either. I think it apparently volunteers. Appoint the chair. A vote. The board votes for the nominating committee. Yes, I would think so. And then the nominating committee selects. I thought you were going to be the Okay, who are the members of the I don't know if that's legal. 
Because there's, you're supposed to advertise all meetings. Oh yes, I thought you meant so you won't have to
top five that we want to allocate most of our resources into. We also have things we want to look at as far as, you know, hours, uh, what might be better uh, as far as, well, the, the, the big one out there is what to do with the main library, what we will want to do with it. It's no longer the main library. Now it's just being called the downtown branch. We've got a fourth floor. We've got some other things to do with it. And we need to decide how we want to uh, proceed. So there's a, there's a list of uh, questions and questionnaires. And once we, once we get our priorities on our services from there, we have to go with goals and objectives and then outputs and outcomes. Long dry out procedure, but we'll, we'll get through it. Um, we still haven't heard from the lawyers from Gannett on whether or not we will become the custodian of the Shreveport Times microfilm and bound volumes. Uh, we're hoping that will move forward from what we understand that wonderful prized uh, collection of materials is in the middle of a construction site. We really would like to get it away from there and someplace where uh, it would be safe and in a friendly environment. Uh, the Friends of the Library, President Jim Gavin, I met him and I, we ran the delivery route for the fun of it right there before the holidays to help out. Uh, again, you've met our new marketing and development person. And we've hosted two more director roundtable luncheons since the last time we met. I have to say those are more fun each time. We did the Add Your Award just the other day. That was fun. Uh, we went out and we finally got our budget adopted from the Paris Commission. And uh, see, we started a brand new partnership with Sideport's New Power Play Children's Museum, where we will be offering every child ready to read uh, programs every second Saturday for about six months to see how that goes yeah, at Sideport. Uh, we've met with the University Health, Community Affairs, and Stroke Prevention staff to plan how the library will participate in Stroke Awareness Month, which is the month of May. Uh, I attended another Chamber of Commerce uh, What's Happening Breakfast. Those are always interesting and fun. And I also chaired another Green Gold Consortium where we decided we will be working together to host a customer service training for all of our frontline staffs here in this building. And now, Kathy would like to talk to you just a moment about some upcoming conventions you may want to attend. Okay, I know of three major convention conferences that are coming up. I want to give you the dates, and I need you to let me know which ones you wish to attend as soon as possible. And then you will need to sign, or, well, I'll have to complete the uh, request for travel and then get you to sign it. Um, the LLA conference will be held in Lafayette this year. The conference dates are March 7th through the 9th. And you want to register for that very soon because that's coming on up. The ALA conference is in Chicago. Let me make sure back up a little bit because there's one before that one. The Book Expo uh, conference is May 31st through June 2nd, and that's in Chicago. The ALA annual conference is also in Chicago, and it's June 22nd through the 27th. Any questions? Do you want to know now? Do you want to know now? No, I do not have to know now. Just, just get in touch with me. Uh, it's best if you go online and look at the registrations, the things offered, so that you will already know what to tell me to register you for. Because I cannot do that for you. I cannot make those decisions. So. And when you do, if it involves airfare and stuff, I'll need to know dates of travel to and from, and the time of day, and any other preferences that you have. Susan Todd is our uh, receptionist and my uh, assistant, and I am letting her handle most of my travel now. I oversee it, but she's doing a great job. So you may be dealing with her some. 
Susan Todd. Susan Todd. Susan. She's the one that sits out front here. She's doing a wonderful job with this. They're every other year, they're not this year, yeah. It's unfortunate. Most of us, I do leave like feel. Um, and now, just for a quick overview of the 2016 budget, Mr. Jim Bell. Thank you. Uh, you all should have received today a copy of the end of the year report, which of course is not final, so I don't want you to get too excited about the numbers on there because it shows over a million dollars uh, more revenues than expenditures, but there will be adjustments made to this. Uh, as you remember, we had to redo our budget for 2017 because the assessor gave the wrong numbers to the uh, Cal Parish officials and people and they set the villages based on getting the same amount of money from the things that were already on the property tax road and then he informed them later that uh, those were not correct but it was too late to change them. And that's for, certainly for 2016, and uh, it's a different process for 2017 if they want to go back to them, <coughs> which logically we would, but I'm not sure it will pass. I don't think they're very optimistic about that. Uh, when, when that came about, it reduced our tax revenue by about 350,000 from the original estimate based on the, those assessors' numbers in which we adopted our budget on. Uh, but what I, what I started doing is, first of all, looking at the budget that was set up in the middle of 2015 for 16 and compared it to what the projected revenues with the uncollectible and all that stuff in there. And uh, it looks to me like we're going to be possibly about 100,000 short of what the projections were in, when we set up this budget. And that we didn't bother with adjusting the budget. Uh, for 2016 because we did have adequate funds in there. But, uh, and, and of course the notice was very late on all of this. Um, but I, I, I compared what, what was budgeted back then and what the likely collections would be if, if Erica's uncollectible projection is right and the tax growth is right and everything like that. So that's, that's the first adjustment. The other thing is, uh, and, and this is uh, real, real frustrating, uh, I had been in late November, early December, I was asking why haven't we received any interest income? And that it's not very much, but uh, you know, the auditors have been on us about we should make sure that our revenues are properly recorded, timely fashion, everything like that. And if we were approaching the end of the year, we hadn't seen anything all year, which is kind of unusual. Last year, we probably received them almost starting in uh, That was the first year of the new system. So it was about June before they start putting them on, but after that, they just put them on monthly. So I asked them, and they said, yes, uh, no, no, get them done. And then, you know, I got into early January, and they still hadn't been posted. So I asked them uh, again. I said, aren't these going to be posted before they close the books and that? And they said, oh, yes, we're going to do that. And 
and so when I came back and started doing the report this final time, uh, I noticed that uh, they had uh, finally posted some numbering on there, but it was a little over $12,000. Last year, we received $70,000. Maybe they aren't done with it yet. That's what I called over there. Uh, and they told me that for the last, since 2012 to 2015, the uh, interest figures were incorrect and that this was discovered by the new auditors. The city went to the same auditors we use and the parish uses. But this was the first year, 2015, uh, was the first year of the audit, and they definitely discovered the interest wasn't credited properly, and was over like $1.2 million in error, and that. So what they decided to do was uh, to uh, reduce our, our interest income uh, and spread it out over five years rather than just deducting it and we would have had a, a very high negative figure on this. <laughs> so um, they, they have decided they're going to spread it out over the next five years starting with 2016. And then, so, you know, we have, Budgeted forty thousand last year for it. We received a little over twelve thousand. Um, we had budgeted for two thousand seventeen seventy thousand dollars, which is what we had received last year, according to the figures, I guess. <laughs> and that so that that's another adjustment in this. Uh, that's mostly it on the revenues. The rest of them are pretty well set and, and done uh, and that. But anyway, there will be some adjustments there. Um, on the expense side, there will be some end-of-the-year adjustments. Uh, often in January and that, they look at the reports and particularly if they see things that were over ten or fifteen thousand dollars, whatever the amount they set uh, that were purchased in January, they make sure those are not bills that were received in December and stuff like that. So there, there, there'll be some adjustments there. Uh, also, the, the one that is kind of a, an unknown one is what they talk about the OPEB, which is uh, Other Post-Employment Benefits. And the auditors are required to audit this in a different way. Uh, we have never had OPEB expenses on our report uh, until the auditors put them on this for 2015. And, uh, we talked a little bit about this at the budget meeting. Uh, what this is for the life insurance, the amount that the city would pay or the library would pay for life insurance, health insurance, uh, dental insurance for employees who are retired, but this city does a matching uh, amount for the, uh, the amount the employee pays for it directly, but they do provide it. Many organizations do not provide any other post employment benefits other than retirement. <clears throat> Last year, it showed up as a $327,000 expense on our personnel, but they offset that because the city of Shreveport, from their general fund, has been handling 
the actual cost for the year 2015 there. But, uh, and, and they just paid it. Uh, and I think they considered it not a significant amount for the few organizations like the library, like some of their revenue generating funds like water and sewer and those type things that uh, are not part of the, this overall city of Shreveport and that. So, well, they showed us $327,000 more in ex personnel expenses. They also showed a city of Shreveport on behalf payment of 327000 so it wiped it out. Uh, Charles Madden, the finance director, says, he said, no budget for it. Uh, it's, it's a end of the year adjustment, if anything. And uh, it was still unclear whether they were just going to continue handling it that way. So that's a, that's a big one, depending on what the changes are in it, uh, if any, from what the way they have been handling it. But anyway, those are the things that potentially affect these numbers. Uh, we won't know the actual tax collections until about April uh, or so when they start doing the audit and figure out what the actual amounts are. So there's still a lot of things. Normally, when you get to the end of the year like this, if you're a business organization, you can pretty well tell what the level is, what, what funds you're generating or not generating, or whatever. Uh, any questions? And yeah, that concludes my portion. Public services. Public services ended 2016 with having provided over 5,000 on-site programs for all ages to over 100,000 attendees. <laughs> Additionally, staff provided over 768 technology classes to a little over 2,400 attendees. Our free library passes to Cyport provided enjoyment to about 1,196 individuals from 2015 to 2016, which equates to a cash savings of $10,764 for our patrons, their families, and friends. Public services staff are now busy planning more programs to keep our patrons informed and entertained this year. Already several exercise and health center programs are in progress to help patients with their New Year's resolutions. And Black History Month programs are being planned as well. The Downtown Libraries for Every Young Adult Book Club will host a book signing and author visit on Saturday, January 28th. Author, young adult author Ashley Elston, who lives in Shreveport, is a guest author. Elton is the author of The Rules for Disappearing and its sequel, The Rules for Breaking. Her latest novel, This Is Our Story, was published in November of 2016. Julie Grice, our children's associate, completed two of the 11 Every Child Ready to Read presentations she scheduled. She did one, she did two um, this past Saturday, one at Hamilton and one at Wallet. And as you all know, Every Child Ready to Read is a parent education initiative and stresses that early literacy begins with the primary adults in a child's life. Parents and guardians who attend these presentations receive a free book to take home to read to a child or to their children. And Lavette Fuller, our teen services associate, will begin presenting a series of programs in February to help high school students plan for their futures. The sessions will rotate to all library branches and will cover ACT prep tutorials and where to find them, ACT work keys preparation, scholarships and financial aid sources, college application assistance, integral skills and business etiquette, 
and the basics of personal finance. Additionally, she will use Tutor.com, which has partnered with Princeton Review, um, and they are now providing information on ACT preparation. And that's an update on public services. Deontay, are y'all still offering the sideboard passes? Yes, and that would include um, entry to the children's room. Oh, great. What dates did you have for those ACT trips? Sorry, I, she hasn't given me any dates yet. She's still planning, but she's rolling them out in February. We'll, we'll make sure you, you get the, the press website. release. Okay. Won't be submitted. Yes, we will. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, and the support services update, I am excited to announce we now have a full functioning marketing and development department made up of Samantha and Ivy, our public relations, and Caleb, our e-branch manager. So you should be seeing some exciting things coming out of that area. Um, I kind of just wanted to summarize and give you an overview of what support services statistics have been um, in training and development. We offered a total of 5,264 hours of uh, training and development for staff, various uh, from leadership training to anti-harassment to our mandatory ethics training. Um, but it was a huge accomplishment. That average is out to about 24 hours per employee per year. And of course, some did more and some did less, but that was the average. In our employment and hiring, we processed over 7,700 applications for the 84 positions we filled. 20 of those were filled with internal candidates and 64 were people hired from the outside. The most exciting thing about that though is we were able to decrease the time it took us to fill a position from 45 days to 35 days. So start to finish from advertising to actually bringing someone on board. So we've really been working to decrease that window. In our access services area, um, our loans department hired and is training a new part-time route delivery person. And during 2016, our cataloging department added over 43,000 items to the catalog and removed over 14,000 items. Our acquisitions department managed to spend 99% of the acquisitions budget, spending $1,339,547. To the penny. <laughs> and then finally, our IT department installed 291 computers. They converted all of our full-time branches service desks so that they are now ADA compliant if we had an employee that needed an ADA accessible workstation. They converted all locations to a new AT&T network and installed um, our own routers at several of those locations. And they also install digital signage in all the lobbies of our full-time branches and our e-branch manager worked on the wording that's now on those uh, signage. Overview of support services. And now for an overview of uh, financial services, maintenance, and risk management. In our maintenance department, we completed more than 11,000 separate transactions last year, so they're very busy. And doing that while a good bit of the year being understaffed with various people off the medical leave. Mm -hmm. We've received hundreds of shipments during the year at our new dock, and we are so appreciative of having an actual dock and a dock person to handle those. We paid thousands of invoices, but we don't really quantify that because one invoice could have you know 21 locations on it, and another invoice could have one or, or whatever. But, uh, and we, we made hundreds purchases, but again, that's not something that our, our buyer quantifies. In our maintenance area in the last two months, we've uh, painted and repaired the walls of the lobby at David Rains at Moortown and the meeting room at Atkins. We picked up all the donated food uh, for the Anderson program and delivered that to the food bank. Uh -huh. That was three tons of food okay. donated to our libraries during that period. That's a lot. Of so while, while we hope for a lot of donations, the maintenance guys are hoping that maybe they're not too much because they have to physically handle all that. So it's kind of a, uh, we upgraded the landscaping at Hamilton South Cattle in Maine. If you want to take a look next time we're in those areas to look for some improvements. We replaced the handicap ramp at Rob Moore. 
And of course, when we had the project to roll out the digital displays, our main instinct was there physically installing those displays so that IT and everybody can work together as a team to make them work. In the uh, risk management area, we uh, fleshed out our building procedures for this building and added emergency evacuation procedures. And we'll be holding some drills soon. And in the uh, financial services area, we finally, after all these years, have closed out the uh, accounts with our contractor and our architect in this building. And I never thought I would see the day. That was, that was a really big thing. Now all we have left is working on some straggler maintenance items uh, for this building that I have to you know, make them do. Uh, we went out for bid on a new electrical contractor. The city says that they have the documents ready. Uh, they just emailed me, so tomorrow I'll be picking those up and, and going through those. And we uh, retained Carl Riggs and Ingham as our financial auditor for the 2016 financial audit. And that's our report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Clark. Board members? Board of Second. Finish moved to the second that we All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Yes. Our next one will be on March 27th, 2017. And uh, I'd like to ask. Uh,